Hey guys, DMS here. Today I have for you the brand new Grado SR325X. Let's check it out. These are $295. They are the successor to the Grado SR325E. The X is the new fourth generation driver. I actually purchased these headphones and then I reached out to Grado because I had some questions and I knew you guys would have some questions. So we're gonna go over what I asked them and what they said in this video, but we're also going to cover things like build, how they compare to other headphones, including things like the Grado Hemp, how they perform both objectively and subjectively. We're gonna talk about measurements, and a bunch more. So let's get into it with build. So here's the SR325X. It is a little bit squeaky, but it doesn't feel like it's going to fall apart or anything. Uh, this is a leather headband on top. Not a lot of padding added to it, but you can feel it is leather, which is an upgrade from the SR60 and 80E. The actual cups themselves are made out of metal with them being plastic on this side. And then we have here the stock pad, which as you can see, it's not very thick. Um, there is just a little bit of depth to it, and it is a foams of two different densities that are in sandwich layers. I asked Grado about a couple of components on here, mainly the pads, the plastic component right here, and the non-detachable cable. Now this cable has been upgraded to a braided cable over the last generation, which is nice, uh, but Grado basically said that they carefully choose the cable. They said it's as good as any cable that it should be durable, and that any sort of cable, they say, would act as a bit of a filter. So they choose a specific cable that they say matches the sound profile they're after, and anything else would be an alteration to that, basically. So whether or not you're a cable guy, that is up to you, but that is essentially their reasoning for having this non-detachable cable. It does feel like it's very firmly connected. I know that probably looks terrifying to see on camera, but this is my job. I got to do this. It does feel very firmly connected, and usually these are knotted on the inside, so you're not actually pulling on the driver or anything like that. I did find comfort to be a little bit lacking, so I did modify this headphone as far as comfort is concerned. Now, before I go into that, I should also note, Grado said that this plastic, uh, while they do use this component on basically all their headphones, they say that it's extremely durable um, and is designed to hold up against their rigorous stress testing. So I can't actually personally make any claims about that, but that's basically what they said. If you want to see everything they said, I'll put it up on the screen at some point during this. But I bought a Geekria HD650 headband support, which by the way, these headphones, this uh, modification, and all the pads here will be linked in the video description if you want to check them out. This thing was like $10 or so, some of that ballpark on Amazon. I just put it right on here and then used a Velcro strap. So one Velcro strap right here, nice and easy, but just to be safe, I added a couple more on the sides, and that holds that on. And then pad swapping is as simple as that. I will say that Grado has probably the easiest pad swap out of any headphone on the planet. Done. Nice and simple. I'm not too concerned about the build of this headphone. I do wish that it didn't squeak. I wish there was more padding on top. And this cable, no matter how I orient it, always has some sort of tangle to it. And as you can see like this, you can rotate them around and then it's fine. But then once you rotate it back to face your ear, it has a different sort of kink in it. So you can't ever really get these to where they're entirely kink free uh, unless you face them both away from your head like this in one direction. So that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. It's not a deal breaker. It's not the end of the world. And that is basically the build of the 325X. Now let's talk about sound. Now this is a big one. A lot of sound is very subjective. And I'm gonna go right off the bat and say this is not a very objective headphone. This is very much towards a subjective tuning. And it's going to change a little bit depending on how you use them. Now, I personally prefer these headphones with different pads. I asked Grado about it because Let's be honest, the stock pads are a little bit small and thin. I didn't find them to be quite as comfortable, but I said, hey, you make a lot of different pads. Do you intend for this headphone to be pad rolled? And here's what they said. We intend the model to be used with the cushions that they are equipped with. Changing them to different cushions will change the voicing and performance. So starting, I'm going to talk about the voicing and performance with the stock pads, and then I'm going to talk about it with several other pads I listen to, among which are the S pads, which I have on there now, and the G pads. The default pads, which I believe are called the F pads, 
Uh, very thin, not the most comfortable thing on the planet, um, but I did warm up to them after the headphone got to spend a little bit more time on my head. They started to get a little bit softer over, say, the first couple weeks of use and eventually sort of leveled out. The sound with these default pads is a bit warm, definitely a mid-range focus. The upper mid-range lower treble has a bit of a peak to it, but vocal clarity really stands out. And then we have a bit of a darker region in the upper treble. Soundstage is decent on these headphones no matter what pads you put on, uh, but it was definitely the most narrow with the stock pads. This sound does not have a ton of bass extension. It does, however, have okay enough bass punch because there is a bit of an emphasis in uh, the lower mid-range and upper bass. It doesn't make the headphones sound bloaty though or mudded, which is nice. A lot of headphones really suffer from this bloaty or mudded sound when they have an emphasis in this region, and the 325X never really got into that territory. So it does warmth well, it does a mid-range focus well. I could do without a little bit of the shoutiness in the stock pads, but truth be told, I still enjoyed the headphone regardless. They're a very odd spot that's very clear with decent staging that's somewhere between headphones and speakers. But for me personally, they really opened up a lot more when I did change the pads. Now this does move into territory that, as stated by Greta themselves, is not uh, for necessarily their intended sound for the headphones. So if you change the pads, you are changing the tuning of the headphone a bit. For me, these pads, the S pads, were the most comfortable out of the lot and didn't change the sound too much. There were some changes. I found that the treble opened up a little bit more on top and the staging actually changed more than anything. So, uh, which we'll look at in the measurements later, the treble only changes by about a decibel or two, but the staging really benefited a lot from having just a slight amount more of space uh, between both the driver and my ear. So a little bit more acoustic impedance. This ended up being my preferred pad and still has both of that warmth and a bit of a darker sound on the upper treble. And when we moved to the G-pad, however, that's when we saw the biggest changes. That's when I heard the biggest changes too. The G-pad on this headphone is like a Grado hemp, but better. It takes everything that I enjoyed about the hemp, but with less sibilance, with less harshness, with more warmth, a more inviting overall tone. Now the G-pad does have more sibilance than the S-Pad or the stock pad. It's going to be more V-shaped than both of those pads. It has the most bass, it has the most bass extension, and it doesn't have any sort of a dark recess in the upper treble. Uh, instead, we're met by mostly flat treble with a couple of larger spikes. Now, not as much as the Hemp, and I would say again, this is not a headphone that's aimed uh, for objective measurements. When we get to talk about the measurements, I wouldn't say pay too closely attention to that because I'm the kind of person where I do love headphones that measure well, but if something sounds enjoyable, I'm certainly willing to praise it. And this is a headphone that sounded so good that I bought it. Soundstage on the G-Pads is fantastic. Almost, not quite, but almost rivaling that of the HD 800S, which is a headphone I have, uh, I've enjoyed for a very long time for its sound staging capabilities and its other technical abilities. And while I think that this is not quite as accurate in its staging and imaging as the HD 800S, it really shares a lot of similar traits and presentation to that headphone. But truth be told, even with its treble spikes, is nowhere near as bright sounding as the HG800. It much more leans towards a warm mid-range focus. And for that, I find it to be very enjoyable. It really is surprising to me the number of parallels that those two headphones draw together in terms of staging and imaging. If the comfort was a little bit more improved, I would almost use this headphone regularly for gaming. I have used it for gaming several times with the S pads on, and actually, as I mentioned in build, I did put on a headband, uh, which I'm not currently wearing on it, but I did put on an HD650 headband. I just Velcro strapped it on and was able to wear it for hours. Another thing this headphone does very well is vocal clarity. Uh, vocals have a very present, very in the room, very crisp, very clear sound. And it's not the same quite as detail and resolution, but it's more the ability to very clearly discern and separate out a center channel vocal or panned vocals without having to worry about other things that overlap in that same frequency range. So 
guitars, strings, all sorts of other instruments. While they do overlap with vocals, the vocal is still very clear. It stands out, it's on its own pedestal, and doesn't get mushed up in the rest of the mix. So if you're a person who appreciates vocal clarity, like with the HD 6XX 600 650, this excels in that area. Resolution-wise, it's very hard to say. This headphone does change from pad to pad. Um, and I feel like as far as overall resolving power, this headphone is on par with the HD 650. Maybe not quite at the HD 650, but they're within the same ballpark. I find the HD 650 can scale much higher on very expensive amplifiers. Um, but if we're talking amplifiers, people are gonna be realistically using in the price range of these headphones. The 325X and the HD 650 are really in the same ballpark. Now, like I said, if you're gonna spend $1,000 on an amp, the 6XX is probably going to take you higher in terms of resolution. But outside of that use case, it really didn't seem to be that different. The biggest differences I noticed were in fit and in tuning, and certainly in staging, because this does stage much wider. Attack isn't quite as fast as some other headphones that I'm referencing in this video. Things like the 800S certainly have a faster attack than this, um, and definitely a faster decay, but I feel as though the attack and decay on this lean more towards a relaxed level of enjoyment that still provides an adequate amount of detail. And it's strange to have a headphone that has a sort of medium attack and decay, but still feels very resolving. It's almost as if the details are all there, but they're not very aggressive in their presentation. Uh, and it lends towards a sound signature and a sound profile that I find to be enjoyable on a wider variety of music. I don't find myself to be as confined to listening to very high resolution tracks to be able to enjoy them. I feel as though I can put on almost anything from my collection and say, you know what, this sounds good. Let's listen to this. Or just shuffle through from album to album and not really feel the need to skip a track when I can tell that it was mixed a little bit too hot. That is a music lover's experience. And I feel like that is an area where objectivism sort of fails to hit the mark with a lot of headphones. And while I would consider myself to fall between the line of both objectivist and subjectivist, this is a very subjectivist take, a very subjectivist review, and there will be lots of people on the objectivist line that will not like this headphone and will also likely criticize this review because of that. Now that said, there's also plenty of great reviewers who I'm sure will not like this headphone and many that will. Uh, Andrew, Resolve Reviews, this is not to your taste. I know that, we talked about this already. Z is going to love this, I'm pretty positive. If he doesn't, uh, you can come back and comment on this video. So here's our first measurement. Just for reference, this is the ear gain region. As it says here, this area naturally elevates in the raw measurements down here on this half to basically show what the human ear does. So our ears naturally elevate in this region, and so will these measurements to show that. Now this green line here is our target curve. This is Krenikal's target that he uses, and the above line is this raw measurement that has been then compensated for his target. So if this headphone measured perfectly flat to Kren's target, it would be a flat red line up here, and a line exactly the same as this green line down here. So here's our raw measurement. Now we can see here that this has okay bass extension, better than the hemp, but it does roll off in the sub bass. But we have enough sub bass presence here, uh, you know, 50 hertz and above, that it is definitely audible. So we roll off a little bit, and then we get some sub bass here, a little bit of warmth, and then a dip right here in the mid range for just a little bit of a moment there. Now this is with the stock pads, and we'll get to the other pads in just a minute. We move through the mid range, it's relatively linear, picks up in the vocal presence region right here, just a little bit over neutral, which you can see here, and then a bit of a dip around 1.8K. A lot of headphones that have good soundstage have a recess somewhere in this region. So I've always wondered if those things actually correlate, but we do have a bit of a dip here. It picks back up a little bit over neutral, so it looks high right here, but if you look at the compensated measurement, it's not too much higher uh, at 2.1K than it is at, say, 1.3K. So we see a little bit of a decibel difference there, maybe like a decibel or two. Uh, another dip, a pick back up again, right to that same region as we're at 
in about 2.2K, 2.1K, we're getting at about 3.6, 3.7K. And then we have this scoop out in our treble, in kind of our upper treble region, uh, from about 3K, uh, sorry, from about 4K to about 9K. And then from 10K on, we really don't listen to the measurements much on um, 603.18-4 rigs. So you can pretty much ignore everything being measured above 10 kilohertz, and really we're gonna pay attention to what's within this region right here. Which, all things considered, that is most of what matters is what's within this region. So a little bit of an imbalance in the treble. Um, it doesn't get too peaky. Really what we see more than peaks is actually dips. Uh, it, it, if you take this out of context, it looks kind of like a peak. But really, I think what we're really just seeing is a bit more of a dip. And if you took all of these dips out, we would have more of something that is relatively linear, closer to a flat line. So I'm going to change this to compensate for Resolve Reviews, uh, Andrew's uh, target curve, which is a Harman hybrid between two different years of the Harman target. Now this is with Resolve's hybrid target. As you can see here, the main difference is that the mid-range is a little bit different, and we expect a bit more sub-bass and less warmth out of this headphone. So comparatively to his target, it's about the same from 1K up, from 900 hertz up. But down here is where we see the biggest differences in target curve. So this is not going to have ample bass for Andrew's target, uh, but it certainly had ample bass, more so than was necessary for Corinne's target. Now, I'm about to show you the S-pad measurements. Now, real quick for reference again, this is Krenn's target right here, Krenicle's target. And this is the S-pad. The biggest changes we see is slightly less warmth, a little bit bigger of an elevation right here at 2.2K, and then up here at 9K, this actually drops down. So this is actually supposedly slightly darker. The interesting thing is that subjectively, this sounded like it had a little bit more air on the upper treble. So in this 10K plus range, we might have more going on that we can't actually accurately measure. But the S pad overall, slightly less warm, a little bit more lower treble and less upper treble. Then we have the G pad against Krenn's target. So this has plenty of bass. Uh, once again, it rolls off about the same region, but a little bit more elevation here, more warmth. The vocal presence region doesn't have that dip or that elevation, which interestingly enough, um, this pad has the most sound stage, but the smallest dip. So very interesting finding there, uh, given that usually, like I said, a lot of headphones with a lot of sound stage have a bit of a dip right here, but this one does not. So we see a bit more linearity in this range. And then we get our two big peaks. These are definitely peaks compared to the other pads. Uh, this headphone has a lot more air with the G pad on it overall. And these two peaks can be pretty harsh at times. The one at eight and a half K is nowhere near as harsh as the one at 3.7K. 3.7K here is definitely the point that was a bit more difficult to deal with out of the two. Um, but I find that in this situation, the warmth of the headphone is usually a lot more uh, prominent as far as any audible audio signatures are concerned than the actual uh, treble spikes up here. So it is a bit V-shaped, but it's a warm V-shaped tone. And finally, this is all three pads compensated for Krenn's target. So in blue, we have the G pads. In red, we have the stock pads. And in green, we have the S pads. Now, I liked all three of these pads. I do think that the uh, G pad is the most balanced out of all of them because it has the smallest dips, but you have to deal with these spikes. And the pad that I found the most comfortable was the S pad overall. Now let's talk power. This headphone takes very little power to be very satisfied. So, topping A90, low gain, sometimes medium gain if you're feeling very brave. For me, low gain. Class A amps like this Broadway S, I barely had to give it any volume. This headphone, like I said, very easy to power. Tubes are really where the magic happened, but you really have to lower the gain going into a tube amp like this because it just has way too much power for this headphone. It sounded really good, but I just had to lower my preamp into this because you can really power this thing off a cell phone if we're being honest. It does benefit from a better DAC, absolutely. But this is a low impedance, very efficient dynamic, and realistically, whatever you plug it into, it's going to power it just fine. Uh, things like this, the IDSD Black Label, are absolutely overkill. You can power this off a Dragonfly Black. 
and get just as much of a benefit as you would off the IDSD black label. But uh, if you're using that at a desktop and at home, something like this Dark Voice or a little Dot Mark II would take you pretty far. However, like I said, you're going to have to either reduce the gain on the amplifier itself, Little Dot has switches for that, or you're going to have to, absolutely have to reduce the line level going into this, the preamp level going into this amplifier because it is just way too much power for these headphones. Things like the A90 sound really good with it, the um, Matrix Element M and the Matrix Mini i3 Pro, I think I said that right. Both sound fantastic. In fact, I really, really love this with the Element M, um, which Element M, that is a $2,000 unit we're talking about, but it's not a very powerful unit. It is very clean and they sounded really, really good together. But I think that I might like this more with the Mini uh, i3 Pro, which thankfully, is a lot cheaper than the Element M, which by the way, there is a review of the Element M coming soon, and this is one of the headphones that I tested it with. But yeah, realistically, this is a very easy to power headphone. It's easier to power than things like the HD800S, easier to power than the HD650, 600, 6XX, any of that. Very, very easy to power in comparison to Planar's things like Sundara. It is among the easiest to drive headphones that I've tested in a very long time, so power is not a concern but a good DAC definitely is. Like I said, you won't scale quite as much as something like an HD650 will onto super expensive amps, but pretty much any of your amps in the $1,000, sub $1,000 range are going to scale pretty well up until a point with these headphones. So guys, I think that is going to wrap this video up. The conclusion is SR325X. I love this headphone. I bought this headphone. I'm going to be keeping this headphone. I like it the most with the S pads. Once again, though, if you want the completely stock experience, you're going to have to stick to the stock pads. I think it did some cool things with tubes, though it doesn't really matter too much what amplifier it's on. Some amplifiers did take it a little bit higher, uh, but as long as you have a decent setup that isn't too harsh, I think you'll do well with this headphone. This is not a headphone for hardcore objectivists. It's more just for someone who wants to kick back and enjoy music. Soundstage being one of the key points, mid-range focused, and that's it. SR325X. I hope you guys like this new style of video. It takes a lot more time to produce, but I feel really good about it. Anyway, I think we're gonna wrap things up there. So guys, if you like this video, do me a favor, leave a like down below, a comment letting me know what you want to see in the future. If you want to get active in the community, you can at forum.hifiguides.com. As always, don't forget to stick around and subscribe for more videos like this in the future. Till the next one, guys. Peace.